um, and and, and um, you can hear me quite well, right? So. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, uh, in uh, uh, let's just go back to the tutorial roadmap. Uh, yesterday we looked at uh, supervised learning, and in today's lecture we're going to be looking at unsupervised learning, in particular focusing a little bit more on generative models. And then the last half an hour I will dedicate to uh, showing you some of the open research questions, some of the big questions that a lot of us in the machine learning community and deep learning community are trying to achieve. So unsupervised learning, if you think about the overall scheme of unsupervised learning, there's a class of non-probabilistic models. So models like sparse coding, autoencoders, you know, versions of uh, k-means algorithms. Uh, so these are uh, models that you know don't really rely on probabilities and and you know uh, use quite successfully. So we'll look at some of those models. And then there are uh, there's a class of probabilistic models. Um, sometimes these are called generative models. So there's a class of fully tractable models, um, like full observed belief networks. Uh, there's a class of neural autoregressive density estimators. There's a pixel recurrent neural network. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll show you some examples of those. Um, tractability here means that we can actually compute the probabilities uh, or the probability of the input data so we can tractably evaluate these models. There is a class of non-tractable models, models like Boltzmann machines, variational encoders, Helmholtz machines, and a whole bunch of other models. And you can really think of these models as graphical models, multi-layered uh, um, uh, graphical models. And we'll focus on those models in this tutorial as well. And if you think about these models, what these models are doing is they're trying to define some form of a density some model of the density, P of X, um, uh, in, uh, whenever we're dealing with uh, unlabeled data. And then we're trying to, you know, uh, use some form of approximate maximum likelihood estimation to find the parameters of, of, of uh, these models. And then there is a class of uh, other models. Um, these are generative adversarial networks and moment matching networks. And we can think of these models as having implicit density, right? They're not really defining P of X. The only thing you need to have is you need to be able to sample them from those models. And I will not cover uh, these kinds of the genetic adversarial networks uh, in this tutorial. I think you're going to have a separate class uh, today or tomorrow on uh, just on GANs. Um, beautiful class of uh, uh, models. Okay, so let's start looking at sparse coding and autoencoders. These are older models, but at the same time, I think it's, it's good to know what they are because they're still being heavily used across uh, a lot of different application areas. So let's look at the sparse coding. Sparse coding was developed by Bruno Hausner and Field back in 96. Um, and it was originally explained, uh, it was developed to explain early visual processing in the brain, right? And the idea is very simple. So here's the objective. Given a set of input data vectors, x1 up to xn, we're going to be learning a dictionary of bases, phi1 up to 5k, such that I can represent my input as a linear combination of my bases. Okay? And one thing, one assumption that I'm going to be making is I'm going to be making that these coefficients are going to be mostly zeros. So they're going to be sparse. So you can think of it as, as, as a way of saying each data vector or each input point is going to be represented as a sparse linear combination of bases. And my goal is to learn both the bases as well as the coefficients, right? So if um, I um, apply uh, this model uh, to images of natural scenes, like the ones that you see in here, I take a little patch um, and I apply sparse coding to it, then I'm going to be learning these bases. And back in 96, when, when people looked at these examples, it uh, was, was very exciting because it seems like this is exactly what, uh, um, you know, the early visual processing in the human uh, uh, visual uh, system is, is some of the neurons and some of the cells are tuned to detect these specific edges. So there's some nice correspondence to neuroscience. Now, if I take a new example, I can basically say this new example is made up by some linear combination of a few bases, right? In this case, three bases. And it turns out that that representation, uh, which is mostly sparse, is a very good feature representation. It's a, it's, uh, it, it has been shown to give, you know, as, as a way of uh, pre-processing the data, the first layer uh, of, of these images, and it turns out to be a very useful representation, sparse representation. Right? So how do we do training? The basic algorithms and the whole family of, of, of these kinds of algorithms. Uh, but the idea is the following. We have an input image patches. 
right? That line sum RD space. And we're going to be learning a dictionary of bases where the number of bases is predefined. So K here, the number of bases is, has to be defined by the modeler. Um, and we form this particular objective function. So let's look at this objective function. The first term in the objective function, it says, I want to, re uh, I want to minimize my reconstruction error, right? Which basically says, I want to be able to find the basis and the coefficients such that I am perfect at, re at uh, reconstructing my data, right? So the first term is the reconstruction error, and the second term is the sparsity penalty, right? That's uh, L1 sparsity, and lambda here is, again, is a trade-off parameter. It tells you how sparse you want to be versus trading off how good your rec reconstruction has to be. Uh, right, and it's typically determined by some form of uh, uh, cross-validation. And it turns out for this particular problem, you can use alternating optimization. So the way uh, you can do it is you can fix the dictionary of bases, phi1 to phi k, and solve for activations. And this is a standard lasso problem um, in which we are then optimal, uh, sort of not the optimal, but uh, efficient uh, um, optimizers are available to solve this problem. And then you can fix the activations, A, and you can optimize the dictionary of bases, uh, and it's a convex quadratic problem problem, uh, a quadratic programming problem, right? So it's sort of doing, fixing, uh, fixing the dictionary bases, it's a lasso, it's a convex optimization problem, you fix the activation, again, it's a convex optimization problem. The overall pro problem uh, is not convex, but uh, you can use this alternating uh, optimization. It's fairly efficient. Uh, at the test time, when I give you a new image patch, and as well as K learned basis, you're going to be outputting a sparse representation A for an image patch X star, right, for a test image patch. And you can think of this sparse representation as a feature representation of that particular image patch, um, right? So for example, as I mentioned before, you know, you take your test input and you're just basically finding uh, what um, um, uh, bases are making up that particular image patch, and then you're representing it, uh, uh, you're, you're using these uh, sparse coefficients as a feature representation. So let's see how it works in practice. Let's say I have my image, and I perform a convolution, uh, this is a convolution operation, over this image, and if I apply these filters, these four filters, I'm going to get these four feature maps, right, which is just uh, a response of a convolution, just a dot product between uh, each image patch and, and the, the, the learned basis. Now, if I take that representation, you can see that what's happening with this image is that you're responding to different edges at different orientations. And it turns out that if I take these features, these sparse features, and just plug them into, you know, a traditional SVN classifier, then just as a way of evaluating the quality of learned representations, you know, this, is done, uh, this was done back in 2006, um, you can see that sparse coding can really improve the accuracy compared to using some logistic regression models on raw data or PCA preprocessing and such. So these kinds of models, people uh, are using them a lot, and particularly in the field of neuroscience, these are very popular models as a way of, of discovering low-level uh, feature representations uh, in, in unsupervised way, right? We, not, we don't need any uh, labels here. We're just trying to find these bases so that we can have good reconstruction error. Now, we can interpret sparse coding as following, right? We can say, well, what is a sparse coding? Well, we can think of sparse coding as having explicit linear decoding, right? Um, the representation that we're learning is sparse is typically overcomplete, so which basically means that k, the number of bases, is larger than, than d, the dimensionality of the input space. We can also think of reconstruction here uh, or decoding as a linear and explicit, right? We take these coefficients. If you tell me what these coefficients are, I just multiply them uh, uh, um, uh, by my basis, and I get my, uh, my data vector x, right? So the decoding is explicit, but the encoding itself, if I'm going from x to a, is implicit and no linear function of x, right? Because we have to solve a lasso problem in order to find these sparse coefficients. So the encoding is implicit, but the decoding is explicit. It's just linear. Uh, and that brings us to um, a general model, a generalization of this model is, is an autoencoder. And you can really think of autoencoders and you have some data, it could be an input image or it could be any other uh, uh, data. Uh, you have an encoding function that takes the data, encodes it into the feature representation, and then you have a decoding function. Given the feature representation, you decode back to the input image. And sometimes the encoder is called fit forward, bottom up, and the decoder is called feedback or generative or top down. 
And sometimes people call it also generative or top-down because if I tell you what features you have, you can reconstruct back the original input. Uh, and the details, what goes inside encoder, decoder, uh, matter. And so there's been a lot of models trying to, you know, come up with different ways of encoding and decoding. Uh, you also need some form of constraint on the feature representation, right? Because otherwise you'll just learn the identity. Uh, and if, you have, if you're learning the identity, then it's not very useful feature representation. Uh, basically, if, you know, the model can just learn to copy the input into the feature space and then reconstructing it back, in which case you have perfect reconstruction. Um, in sparse coding, in particular in sparse coding, sparsity is the constraint that says that I want my representation, my feature representation to be sparse. Right, so for example, one way of uh, uh, getting binary features is also very popular is you're using sigmoid function, nonlinear function as an encoder, and you use a simple linear function as a decoder. So that's one way of uh, using encoder. Um, let's say we look at the encoder with D inputs and D outputs and K hidden units. So given an input X, uh, the reconstruction is given by this expression, right? So here, this is an encoder take a linear combination, much like in neural networks that we've seen, you have a logistic function here, a sigmoid function, and then you have the decoder. The second part is the decoder. This is the representation, this is the feature representation, and you go through the decoder back to the original space. And what you can do is you can determine the network parameters, W and D, by minimizing the reconstruction error, right? So you can say, well, how do I find uh, parameters here, my encoding and decoding, in such a way that I can minimize my reconstruction error? So this is a standard formulation for pretty much all of the autoencoder models, right? There is an encoder, there is a decoder, and you're trying to minimize some form of reconstruction error. It turns out that if the hidden and output layers are linear, uh, then the learned K units, all right, in this particular representation, these are linear features, the K hidden units will span the same space as the first K principal components. So what that means is that in this case, if the encoding and decoding is linear with shared weights, with shared parameters in the encoder and the decoder, then the model will basically be equivalent to PCA, right? The, the latent representation will span the K principal components, and that's basically the definition of PCA. So you can think about this particular model with nonlinear uh, hidden units and nonlinear uh, transformation the, for the encoder. You basically have a nonlinear generalization of PCA, uh, which is kind of neat. Um, you can also, uh, if your data is binary, uh, you can use this particular model. You have a sigmoid uh, to learn the representations and then the sigmoids to reconstruct it back. And it's very much related to restricted Boltzmann machines, something that we'll look at today uh, a little bit later. Here's another uh, model that was developed back in 2009. It's called predictive sparse decomposition. What it's effectively doing is it's saying, look, it's almost like a sparse coding, except for I'm going to try to have an explicit encoder, right? Because one of the drawbacks of sparse coding is that given a task patch, I have to solve lasso to find my coefficients, right? But in this particular formulation, you can say, well, I can actually try to approximate uh, uh, the getting my features uh, or the lasso problem via just an explicit mapping, right? So you have a decoder. If you look at the decoder, this is exactly what Lasso is trying to solve. This is the problem of, uh, sorry, this is the problem of sparse coding. This is exactly what sparse coding is. And then you have this additional term, the encoder term, which basically is saying, look, try to find, try to find the parameters uh, as well as the Z vector such that my encoding is as close as possible to the solution of the Lasso problem. Right? Which is very nice because it kind of speeds things up at the test time. At the test time, you don't really need to solve the Lasso problem you can just use this encoding explicitly. And then what you can do is you can stack these autoencoders and uh, at the end of the day, and people have been doing that as a way of pre-training um, uh, the deep, deep networks. And this is sometimes known as a greedy layerwise uh, learning, uh, right? And this is, has been shown quite successful, particularly for examples where you have lots and lots of unlabeled data and not that many labeled examples. So in this case, you're learning these low-level features, these mid-level features in a completely unsupervised way, and then you're following with, with the classification, right? And typically what happens is that you remove the decoder part and just use feed-forward part as a way to uh, train your uh, neural network. Uh, 
Um, and this is, could be a standard or convolutional network, and parameters can be fine-tuned by using backpropagation algorithm. So people have looked at that. In the settings, again, in the settings when there are lots of unlabeled examples and few labeled examples, these models work quite well. In the settings where you have lots and lots of examples, lots of labeled examples, it seems like video wise to training is not really helpful or it doesn't really help that much. Right? So there's kind of a sweet spot but when it helps and when it doesn't. Um, just I wanted to show you a couple of examples. This is an example of training deep autoencoders. You take these images and you, uh, these are 28 by 28 images of Olivetti faces, and you're compressing them down to 30 dimensional space, right? 30 dimensional subspace. And you can sort of train the stack of RBMs here. I mean, it could be the same as autoencoders. And then you're unrolling them and then you're fine tuning this whole deep autoencoder. And it's kind of interesting what, what, what you can see here. So here I'm showing to you, uh, the top row shows original faces. The second row shows reconstructed faces from 30 dimensional space. Uh, and the last row shows you PCA faces, right? So you can see that PCA fudges up a lot of things, whereas the deep autoencoder can preserve, you know, um, uh, it, it's much sharper it and can preserve uh, a lot of structure in the data. Uh, it also does interesting things like regularizing a little bit. Like if you look at this guy with glasses, <clears throat> its reconstructed version is without glasses. So the model is effectively learning to remove glasses because it's not part of, uh, it seems like there's only one person with glasses and so it kind of loses that information or figures out that's not important to, uh, to carry in the code space. It also tends to move mustaches, right? So you can see if this guy removes the glasses and a mustache, right? So there is a form of uh, regularization that's taking place here. Um, this is another example. Uh, I've shown you uh, I've shown you this uh, last time, but this is a way of of uh, exactly building this deep autoencoder that projects the data from 2,000 uh, most frequently used words into two-dimensional space. And so you can see comparison between nonlinear deep autoencoder and just uh, a PCA model, which is this is a latent semantic analysis, which is effectively does SVD. So it's it's a linear uh, linear version of an autoencoder. So you can see the differences between going from linear to nonlinear. So clearly, nonlinearity can, can, can buy you a lot if you can train these models uh, um, reliably. Now, let me jump into the generative models, right? So, so far, we've looked at the models that effectively trying to use some form of reconstruction or some form of prediction. Um, but let's look at the, uh, the generative models. Uh, one class of models uh, that have been shown very recently to, to, to work quite well is to explicitly model conditional probabilities. So I can write the joint probability of my data in this way, right? I can say, well, there's a probability of the first dimension times the conditional probabilities of, you know, uh, this is just a simple probability decomposition, right? I can always represent it that way. And now what I can do is I can say each conditional can be a complicated neural network, right? It could be multi-layer neural network. So all I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to predict the values of a single pixel given, you know, uh, uh, a set of surrounding pixels uh, or set of uh, um, pixels that I, the model has predicted, or predicted already before, right? So the decomposition really goes probability of x1, probability of x2 given x1, probability of x3 given x2 and x1 and so forth. And there's been a number of successful models, including neural regressive density uh, estimators and various versions of it. Um, just last year, there were a couple of models based on pixel convolutional neural nets, pixel recurrent neural nets. It, all that basically means is the kind of structure you put on this complicated neural network. Do you want to make it convolutional? Do you want to make a recurrent network out of it and such? But the idea is, again, you're simply predicting these, these conditionals. And people have shown that it can generate pretty good looking images. Like if you look at these images, it's actually pretty remarkable what, what these models can do. Um, of course, one problem with these models is the ordering. How do you define the order? And right now it's kind of arbitrary. There's been some extensions in uh, neural autoregressive density estimation work where people have tried to look at, you know, considering all possible orderings. But again, that's something that uh, uh, is uh, um, the model has to specify, the model has to specify. It's also, for these kinds of models, it's not clear what the representations are or what the hidden representations are, right? Because you simply think, you can think of these as a bunch of different models where each model learns class conditional probabilities. Not class conditional, but uh, the conditional probabilities. 
right? So these these are, uh, are models uh, that uh, uh, that have been gaining a lot of popularity just in the last couple of years. But let me step back and uh, give you uh, an introduction to some of the older models. Uh, one of the models um, uh, that's been around for about 20 years now, I think it was developed back in 86, is a restricted Boltzmann machine model, right? It's an instance of a graphical model. Uh, you can think of this model where you have stochastic binary visible variables V, and you have stochastic binary hidden variables H, and you can think of H as feature detectors. You can specify the joint probability distribution of observed and hidden variables, and um, it's given by this expression. You can think of it as just a log linear model, all right? Because if I take the log of the probability, it's linear in the parameters. So people sometimes call it Markov random fields, Boltzmann machines, log linear models. The interesting thing about this class of models, um, it's a bipartite graph, is that the conditional probability of your data given the features is given by the product of logistic functions, right? So what that means is that if you tell me the features that you see in the data, I can actually generate the data for you. I can specify the distribution over the observed data, right? It's just given by this, uh, by this expression here. So what kind of features uh, these models are learning? Uh, well, if you train them on these handwritten characters, you're learning, you know, little edge-like structures. So you can see lots of similarities with, you know, autoencoders as well as sparse coding models. And the idea here is, again, is that given a new image, you can basically say, well, this image is made up by uh, these features. Uh, you get, you typically get, so you typically get sparse representations because not all features get activated. Um, and that's the representation. So it's, you know, at, in a nutshell, these are probabilistic models. You can define probabilities. But if you look at sparse coding models, or if you look at um, uh, autoencoders, sparse autoencoder models and such, they basically learn very similar representations. If you apply these models to million, uh, four million unlabeled images, you're learning these features, right? Which is kind of interesting. Um, if you apply it to the Reuters data set, which is just bags of words uh, or count data, you get these representations, you get these learned topics. And again, the intuition is that what these models are doing, they're basically saying every single image is made up by some combination of these features. Or every single document or web page here is made up by some linear combination of these topics. All right, so you can see there's a topic about Russia, about US, about computers and stuff like that. So it's kind of interesting that you see that these models, when applied to one form of data, find interesting structure, when applied to a different form of data, you find another interpretable and interesting structure. You can also use this model for collaborative filtering. It was one of the state-of-the-art models. Um, and the idea is the same. You're representing your observed data as a multinomial uh, 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 visible, which just represents user ratings. And you have binary hidden features, which are your user preferences. And if you apply it to the Netflix data set, and you look at what kind of features the model is learning, um, looking at individual hidden units, you typically can pick up these genre, right? So there's something about uh, horror movies, like one hidden unit picks up uh, representation about horror movies. There's something about um, um, scary movies or funny movies and action movies. And it's also kind of interesting because there's apparently one unit that finds uh, uh, Michael Moore's movies, right? So these are all Michael Moore's movies, except for the last one I was told. This is not Michael Moore movie. Um, but in any case, it sort of finds this particular structure that users either like Michael Moore's movies or they don't like the movies, so it kind of has specific units dedicated to just capturing representations of, 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 of his movies, which is kind of uh, interesting when you're discovering that in the data. And so you can model different moda modalities, right? You can model binary, Gaussian, you can use softmax, uh, but an interesting thing about this class of models is that it's very easy to infer the states of the hidden variables, right? So the posterior probability is given by this, this, this product of logistic function. And that comes from the definition of these undirected graphs, undirected graphical models. And this is very different from Bayesian models or directed graphical models, right? Because in Bayesian models, you have a prior and you have a likelihood. And given the data, you have to do, you have to do uh, uh, some form of uh, posterior over your latent variables, right? And it can be computational intensive. For these classes of models, computing posterior is actually easy. Uh, right, it can be done in closed form and it's easy to infer, uh, which is very important for, you know, things like uh, information retrieval and classification because you need to be able to classify things very accurately uh, uh, and it needs to be done very efficiently.
Sometimes these models are called product models. Uh, if you look back in the literature, back in late 90s and early 2000s, uh, people would call these models product of experts. And the reason why is if I look at the joint distribution, the joint distribution has a log linear form. But if I marginalize over the hidden variables that I sum these out, I have this form, which has a bunch of product uh, of these functions. Right? But let me give you an intuition of what this means. Suppose that I have a model that's discovering these topics. And suppose I'm going to tell you that topics government corruption and mafia occur in a document. Right? And if that's the case, the word Silvio Berlusconi will have very high probability. Right? I hope you guys know who Silvio Berlusconi is. Right? He's a uh, uh, former prime minister of Italy, and he was in the government. There were a bunch of corruption scandals, and he apparently has ties to mafia. Uh, right? And so this is why it's called product, because each particular unit defines a distribution of words, defines a topic. Uh, but what happens is that when I, each one can define a broad distribution, but, but then I multiply these distributions together and renormalize, which is exactly this operation, I can be very precise about what kind of data or what kind of uh, words I'm seeing in my data. Right? which is very different from mixture-based models, even topic-based models, like admixture-based models. In topic-based models, typically what you do is you choose a topic, and then based on the choice of the topic, you generate a word, right? so, which is very different uh, from these, these product models. And typically, these models work much better in terms of information retrieval or finding, uh, finding uh, uh, distributed representation or finding re better representations. Um, and also models like PCA, factor analysis, other instances of, of kind of finding these distributed representations. Okay, so then you can go beyond the single layer model, right? You can say, well, if the first layer model will, will, will be learning low level features, much like we've seen in autoencoders uh, or in um, sparse coding models, for images you're finding these edges, for text you can find these first order correlations between the, um, uh, the words, but then you can add another level of hierarchy and with the hope that you can learn higher level features, right, which is a combination of edges. So you're learning simpler representation and then composing it into more complex ones, right, and this is one instance of a Boltzmann, deep Boltzmann machine model. And the overall model formulation, you can view this model as just an undirected graph, graphical model, it's a Markov random field, you have dependencies between hidden variables, and all connections are undirected. The difference from the previous model is that this first term is exactly what we had when we were modeling RBMs, and now you have these two additional terms, right? And these two additional terms are moral dependencies between H1 and H2 and H2 and H3, right? Um, there is also a very natural notion just by definition of this model, bottom up and top down. So if I look at the probability of this hidden variable taking value one, it really is given by the states of the hidden uh, uh, units above and the states of the hidden units below, right? And, they, and uh, you're passing it through the sigmoid. So um, in this case, hidden variables are dependent even when conditional on the input. So this is the case where given the data, inference over the states of these hidden variables becomes a little bit more complicated, right? Because if I'm trying to infer the state of this variable, it really depends on what the high level units are thinking as well as what the low level units are thinking. So it requires a little bit more expensive um, approximate inference. Now, in terms of fitting this model, um, you can use approximate maximum likelihood. And it turns out that uh, uh, the maximum likelihood rule has this interesting form. It's the difference between expected sufficient statistics driven by the data and expected sufficient statistics driven by the model. And this is the learning rule, which is pretty much uh, the same for all of the undirected graphical models, Markov random fields, conditional random fields, um, and, and, and such. In this case, for this particular model, both expectations are intractable. And the reason why they're intractable, because trying to infer the posterior of the hidden states is no longer factorial, so you have to do some, some more work. And let me just give you an intuition of what this model, uh, what the learning is doing here. Let's say I have my data, and I get to observe these handwritten characters, right? Well, one thing that I need to do is I need to make these these, uh, uh, um, this data be more uh, probable, right? So I need to raise the probability of, of these data points. At the same time, if I look at this image, right? If I look at this image, then uh, um, I want to make the probability of this image be small, right? Because it's a random image. But if you think about this, uh, these are 28 by 28 images, so there are 784 
dimensional data, but there are, uh, this is binary data, so a pixel can be on or off. And that means that there are two to the 784 possible configurations, uh, right? And that's an exponential space. And this is exactly the role of the partition function. And so the gradients of the log of the partition function is precisely what, what this term is. So it's essentially trying to make sure that you assign small probabilities to these uh, random images. And the true that data lies in an exponentially small subspace, right? So you're trying to figure out, uh, raise the probability of, of these data points. So that's kind of what, what the learning is, uh, what the learning is doing. And then for this particular model, you can use variational inference. Uh, to approximate these data-dependent expectations, and you can use Markov chain Monte Carlo-based in inference to approximate or something called stochastic approximation to approximate the second term. There's been a lot of work uh, in the last decade on using other variational, more sophisticated variational approximation algorithms, like looking at the better free energies that can be potentially used to approximate these expectations as well. Um, uh, but uh, uh, one question, and, and then for this kind of model, you can show that under certain conditions, you can reach asymptotically stable point of, of, uh, of the local optimum, uh, but in, in, in reality, you know, does, does it actually work, right? Uh, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you two uh, panels, if you haven't seen this. On one panel, you'll see real handwritten characters. On another panel, you'll see simulated, uh, uh, or uh, data simulated by the model. And these are handwritten characters coming again from 50 different alphabets around the world. And if you look at this, you know, I typically ask the audience to, to think about how many of you thought this was simulated and this is real. Um, or the other way around, uh, right? And how many of you would have guessed that what's, what's real, what's simulated? And if you actually look at the data itself, again, you'll start realizing that this is simulated and this is real. Right. If you look at this particular handwritten character, um, you can see that it's not quite there. Uh, and also, if you look at the diversity of handwritten characters in the real data, it's much more diverse. And this has to do with the fact of, of inability of Markov chain to explore this exponential space um, efficiently. So there's a lot of work in statistical physics as to trying to find better ways of approximating these, these expectations or better ways of using Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to explore this exponential space. Um, and also, you know, it's, it's the trick that I typically use uh, that I learned from neuroscientists that if I show you these two panels qu quickly enough, you won't tell the difference, uh, right? Um, if you apply these models and see, you know, how well they do in terms of recognizing characters and, and recognizing digits, these models do quite well. Uh, these are older results, but at the same time, you know, if you compare uh, them to, to other models like neural nets or support vector machines and such, um, they can do fairly well. They can also use them for doing interesting things like reconstruction, like pattern completion. So here you're seeing examples um, of uh, 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 oh, example of, of uh, objects, and this is what the model would do as a completion. All right, so you can see that if there is an airplane, it sort of figures out they should be a wing. If there is a person, she figures out they should be a leg and an arm. And this is what the true data looks like, right? So you can use these, these, uh, these kinds of models for in-painting. Um, so these kinds of models, uh, uh, sorry, let me step back. These kinds of models, you know, work fairly well. And then we sort of started thinking about how can we actually apply these models to real data? So let me show you an instance of this model applied to a little bit more realistic setting. Uh, which is a setting of, of learning from multimodal data. If you look at the data um, today, uh, it really is a combination of different data sources, right? Images are typically associated with text. If you look at robotics applications, you have multiple different sensors that are coming in. And so how can you make use of, of that data? And we started looking at um, uh, applications of images and text, because that's one of the standard applications that a lot of people in machine learning and deep learning community are looking at. If you look at these two representations, they, they have very different input representations, right? Images are typically dense. Uh, text is typically sparse and discrete, uh, right? So it's, it's very difficult to learn cross-model features just looking at the low-level features. The other challenge is that the data is typically noisy and there are lots of missing data. So here's an example uh, coming from the Flickr data set. Uh, 
you have an image and you have missing data. So for this image, for example, there is no text associated with that image. Um, and if you're building uh, a generative model, you can see this is the text generated by the model, um, just basically generating bag of words. So you can see that it's kind of uh, generating uh, realistic or reasonable looking things. So what can we do? One thing that we can do is we can start building this hierarchical model. We can use a Gaussian model, which can model real value dense image features, and we can use something that's called replicated softmax model that models word counts, and we can just build the hierarchy out of it. Um, and, and if this hierarchical, uh, uh, this hierarchical model, you can think of it as saying, well, take images, learn some representation, take them to the H2 space. Uh, you have some word counts. Again, represent them in the same H2 space, uh, uh, second layer, and then model the dependencies between the two. There is also, again, very natural notion of bottom-up and top-down, so information propagates up and down in this network, up and down in this model. Right? So this is just an example of text generated from images. So you can see that in many cases it does reasonably well uh, in terms of tagging the image or generating uh, uh, the image. But the real interesting thing that I'd like to show you is that it's not just a simple tagging. It's not like given an image, I tell you the text. Because it's a generative model, what I can do is I can look at the conditional probabilities. I can say, given an image, generate me a distribution over the words. And what I'd like to show you is I'd like to show you uh, samples drawn by the model after 50 steps of GIP sampler. And I'm hoping that the connection is going to be uh, good enough so you can at least, if you look at this part, so that you can see samples uh, generated by the model. Right? So, so for example, he's generating beach, uh, now he's generating sea, beach, island, vacation. Then it generates water, Canada, BC, British Columbia. Then it generates Italy, water, sea, boat, Italia. Um, now it generates sea, sky, blue, city. Now it generates Nikon D200, what kind of camera was used to take, uh, to take the picture. Then it now jumps to California, beach, landscape, ocean, Pacific. And it goes back to Italy, beach, Italia, lake. So what I'd like to point out is that, you know, what, what it shows is that there is this, this distribution is multimodal, right? It goes and talks about Mexico and Brazil and what is there. Then it jumps to BC, British Columbia, Canada. Then it goes to what kind of camera was used to take this image, right? So you can see that this, there are many different ways of describing what's going on in the image. Uh, and as you go through the sampling process, it gives you many different alternative uh, explanations of of, uh, of what, uh, uh, what the image could be. So now it samples Australia, Ocean, Queensland, Sydney, Victoria, Melbourne, right? So it's sort of, um, again, it's almost like, you know, people take pictures and people tag it with different locations and where these pictures were taken and the model kind of uh, does that. So that gives you some notion of also uh, um, measuring uncertainties of different, uh, different tagging, but giving you the full distribution of all possible explanations that the model is discovering for that particular image, right? Here are some examples of failed cases that I'd like to show you. Uh, uh, this is kind of funny to look at, uh, particularly if you look at the second one, right? For this particular image, it generates Obama, Barack Obama election. And we've tried to look at why the model does this. And it's one of those things that, um, this is a Flickr data set, and there are a lot of images of, of, of animals. But there were lots and lots of images of Obama signs uh, uh, because the data set was collected back in 2008, 2007, so there's a lot of blue and white Obama signs, and so the model fails in that case. Although when we estimate the confidence or when we estimate you know, the overall uncertainty of, of these predictions, the uncertainties are quite high. So the model just goes all over the place if you sample from this model. It talks about Barack Obama, then it starts talking about some other things, and it, you know, one has nothing to do with another. Uh, so there's a lots and lots of uncertainty, and you can at least detect that uncertainty in, in, uh, when, when you're training uh, these models. Because it's a generative model of both images and text, you can, you know, do the other way around. Given tags or text, you can also go the other way and retrieve images, right? These are some examples of image retrieval, and the last one is a failure case. If you look at chocolate cake, the very last row, this is what it retrieves, so it confuses, you know, there's some patterns there, but there's uh, a little bit of confusion there as well. Um, this is the kind of data that was used to train uh, these images. You have a million uh, images along with user assigned tags. Uh, 
Uh, so you can see sometimes tags are useful, sometimes they're not useful in terms of telling what you see in the images. And one thing that I'd like to point out with the results is that, you know, compared to um, some of the other approaches, one thing that I want to emphasize is that this data also had 25,000 labeled examples, but basically people tagging what you see in the images. Um, and it has a million unlabeled examples, just data, noisy data coming from the Flickr data set. And one interesting thing I'd like to point out is that this unlabeled data for this particular model was helping because we were pre-training and learning the generative model on unlabeled data and then just fine-tuning it a little bit on the labeled examples. So this is a setting where unlabeled data was helping us a lot in terms of being able to have a much better model. If you look at the numbers here in terms of mean average precision or precision at 50, there is, there is a big jump going from just using labeled examples versus using unlabeled examples and building these generative models, particularly because they can help us deal with noisy examples much, much better than, um, uh, than simply using discriminative approaches. Okay, so let me now jump into another class of models that I'd like to um, uh, emphasize. And over the last few years, these classes of models have been gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, these models are called Hellholz machines. Um, and they were introduced back in 1995. Um, and if you compare them, uh, what they are, they're slightly different. They belong to the class of directed graphical models. So you have a prior over some high level, in this case prior with H3, and then you have a generative process to generate the data. And then there is a recognition model that given the data X, there is some approximation to the states of these hidden variables. And typically that approximation would be some form of a neural network. Um, that gives you the posterior over these hidden states, right? So that's another class of model. And if you compare it to a deep Boltzmann machine, you can sort of see two models are somewhat similar, but semantics are very different, right? In deep Boltzmann machines, it's an undirected model. So you have to run MCMC to sample from it. In Helmholtz machine, it's a, it's a directed model. So you can just instantiate the prior and then you generate the data. The problem with Helmholtz machines is that inference becomes very difficult because given because of explaining away, given the data, you have to do sophisticated uh, uh, inference in order to figure out the states of the hidden variable. So typically people do some form of approximation which gives you feed-forward approximation. In deep Boltzmann machine, there's a very natural notion of bottom-up at top-down, uh, top so it's a little bit more efficient, but can also use, we also use approximate inference. So both of these, uh, semantically, these models are quite different. But they, you know, in one case, some models have, are more powerful than, than others. Uh, uh, but these are just two different classes to, to keep in mind. So let me show you what uh, the class of variational autoencoders are. All right, it's an instance of a Helmholtz machine, uh, but with a very special trick. So the variational autoencoder defines the generative process in terms of ancestral sampling through a set of hidden stochastic layers, right? So you can think of it as saying, well, there is a prior over the higher level, and then you have a bunch of these conditionals, and I'm going to be summing out all the, all of the states of the hidden variables. That's the definition of the model. So theta here denotes the parameters of the variational autoencoder, and L is the number of stochastic layers. Um, and one of the important uh, um, uh, points that I want to make is we need to be able to sample, and we need to be able to evaluate each particular conditional probability, right? So this, this form has to be known, and then I have to be able to evaluate it, and I have to be able to sample from it. That's a requirement for this model, which is not an unrealistic requirement. I know that you will probably have a much more in-depth uh, uh, lecture on variational encoders, so I will not be spending a lot of time on them, but just give you some, some highlights. The conditional probability here uh, can be represented as a complicated nonlinear relationship. So this conditional probability could be a deterministic uh, neural network itself, right? So just to give you an example, here's a setting where I have some stochastic layer, and then this is a deterministic layer. It could be multiple deterministic layers. That's a stochastic layer, and that's my data, right? So basically, I can say this conditional probability is just a one-layer neural network in this particular uh, example, right? So that makes these models very powerful because I can have these conditionals be complicated uh, uh, nonlinear models themselves, right? And the key idea behind variational uh, autoencoders is this idea of training the variational bound to maximize the variational low bound, right? So this is a uh, instance of variational bound. I'm not going to go into too many details, but the idea here is that I have this generative model. 
I have this approximate recognition model I'm going to be denoting by Q. So Q of H given X, that's an approximate recognition uh, uh, model. And I'm going to be maximizing variational bound. My Q will have its parameters. My P, which is my generative model, will have its own parameters. Right? And I'm just going to try to maximize this variational bound. And the variational bound itself has a very simple form. It's basically saying that um, if I look at log of the expectation, it's, it's always low bounded by expectation of the log, just by the convexity of the log function. Um, you can also view variational bound as trying to maximize the probability, the log probability, which is what we want to do, minus something that's called KL diverges between our approximation to the true posterior and the true posterior, right? So, and one of the things about uh, Helmholtz machines is that this was done back in 95 by Hinton uh, and, 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 and the company uh, back at University of Toronto. Uh, so they've derived this, but the problem has always been the case. It's very hard to optimize this variational bound with respect to the recognition model. It's very hard to just basically take this bound and say take the derivative with respect to Q function. Um, because of the high variance in the gradients. Uh, so in the original model, uh, uh, Hinton and all, they developed something that's called wake sleep algorithm that was kind of maximizing a different KL um, uh, in a different way. But generally, it was very hard to get this model to work in practice. And in the last couple of years, this was a very neat trick introduced by King and Welling, is to use something that's called reparentization trick. And it's a very beautiful trick, very simple trick, which basically allowed these models to be optimized much more efficiently and reducing the high variance in the gradient estimation much, uh, again, far, it was a big reduction in the gradient. And that's why these models have become so popular, just because training these models has become uh, uh, doable, right? So let me just tell you um, about the reparentization trick. I think it's a very easy trick. And just to give you an intuition of what, what it does. So let's say that the recognition uh, model is Gaussian, right? So I'm trying to say, well, my recognition, trying to infer the states of the hidden variables at the layer above, given the layer below, which is given by this Gaussian with mean and variance, right? What I can do is I can alternatively, I can express this term, these Gaussian terms in terms of auxiliary variables, right? I can say sample epsilon from normal zero identity and then represent my H via this form. Uh, right, so it's a it's a variance uh, square root of the variance times epsilon plus the mean, right? So this is just another way of representing a Gaussian, um, right? But this is this becomes very critical. Why does it become critical? It becomes critical because now when I compute my h, if somebody tells me what epsilons are, this transformation is deterministic, uh, right? So the recognition distribution can be expressed in terms of a deterministic mapping. I can say my recognition distribution has these parameters epsilon and x, where epsilon is some you know, uh, uh, samples from a normal zero identity. right? And notice that these epsilons don't depend on parameter theta. It's just normal zero, one, uh, zero identity. Right? And the mapping itself is deterministic. So what effectively we're doing is we somehow kind of representing our recognition model in terms of a deterministic mapping plus some noise, right? Which is going to be very important. And so we have a deterministic encoder and the distribution of these epsilons does not depend on parameters. So that's important. Why is it important? Well, it's important because of the following thing. If I take the gradients with respect of the parameters to both recognition and generative model, this is the gradient of uh, uh, the variational bound. I can say, well, look, if I'm trying to approximate the gradients, I can do the following. I can just sample these epsilons from normal 0, 1. And now I'm taking this log ratio of, uh, of this term, where I have the generative model and recognition model. But my h is here. The states of the hidden variables are going to be functions of epsilon, uh, right? Uh, and that's the epsilons are going to be given by normal 0 identity. So, so far, I haven't really changed anything. And the real trick now is to take this gradient and push it inside the expectation, uh, right? And the reason why I can do it is because this expectation doesn't really depend on the parameters. So I can always put this gradient inside. And so what the reparentization trick is doing is it's basically saying, look, instead of computing expectation and taking the gradient, what you're effectively doing is you're computing the gradients and then you're computing expectation.
And it turns out that that reduces the variance drastically. Because now, when I take this gradient, this whole system is deterministic. So I can actually use backpropagation algorithms and backpropagate through the states of the latent variables themselves, right, for a fixed epsilon. And that's precisely what allows one to train these parameters efficiently because I can use backpropagation, right? I can backpropagate through the entire model. I can backpropagate through the generative model and, and recognition model, which essentially becomes an autoencoder, right? And then you have this uh, expectation of, of the noise. Uh, and so it's effectively an autoencoder, which is a beautiful, uh, very beautiful trick. Very easy, but very beautiful. The other thing I wanted to point out, there are ways of, of extending these models um, that can improve the variational bound by using the following K sample importance weighting uh, bound. Uh, so you can say my lower bound is given by this expression. So instead of drawing one sample, you can draw multiple samples, right? And it has this particular form, which is just uh, uh, sometimes is viewed as a K sample importance weighted uh, of the log likelihood bound. Uh, the interesting thing about importance weighted autoencoders or I ways is that as k, the number of samples goes to infinity, you can basically close the gap between log likelihood and the variational bound. So in expectation, every single sample improves the variational bound. So it kind of nicely gives you a tra trade off between how loose your variational bound is uh, versus how much computation you need to do. So if you need to draw more samples, uh, you can, you can uh, get your low bound uh, to be much tighter. Another thing about these models is that they can potentially represent multi-model posteriors. So if your Q here is not, doesn't have a single mode but has multiple modes, these multi-sample bounds can actually get you there. So this is something that for those of you who are interested in, in looking at variational autoencoders as well as uh, looking at more uh, complex approximations to the posterior, uh, and having more accurate approximation in the recognition network, you can look at, uh, uh, at the uh, multi-sample bounds. Um, so let me just show you one example. I'd like to show you just one example of where these models can be used. Um, this is just a, singular, a simple example of trying to generate images from captions. Right? So given a caption, given a description, can I generate the image? And you can think of this model as a stochastic recurrent network. Well, you can think of this model as just a chain sequence of variational autoencoders. So every single, no, uh, uh, um, every single sort of like column here is a variational autoencoder, and you're just chaining them up through some uh, uh, latent variable z. And you have the generative model, and you have the recognition model, right? So there's a generative model that is an inference network. This is just an instance of a variational autoencoder, um, but it's conditional on the text. And you can also do interesting things like uh, uh, generating images from natural language descriptions, uh, right? And you can use sort of these recurrent networks to, to get the representation of sentences. So here's an example of a stop sign is flying in blue skies and a yellow school bus is flying in blue skies. And you also have a herd of elephants is flying in blue skies and a large commercial airplane is flying in blue skies. So it's interesting that these kinds of models are capable at least to generate things that are nonsensical, right? Like this, this, this stop sign is flying in blue skies, it kind of generates something reasonable. Or elephants, we can't really generate realistic looking elephants, but at least it sort of tries to uh, generate this, this kind of representation, all right? You can also have interesting things like a yellow school bus is parked in the parking lot, a red school bus, a green school bus, a blue school bus, right? So it's interesting, the model sees blue cars and it sees school buses, but it never sees blue school buses. Uh, at the same time, it sort of tries to at least paint something that's representative of, of a school bus, at least what it thinks is a school bus, uh, which is kind of interesting. And here's an interesting thing that, you know, uh, you can also, this is an example of a toilet seat, it's open in a bathroom. Sometimes you see toilet seat, sometimes you don't. Uh, uh, and then you can also generate a sentence, the toilet seat sits open in a grass field. So this was actually pretty interesting, right? Because it kind of tries to paint white on, uh, on uh, the grass. So it, so it starts understanding that the grass field typically has like yellowish, or oh, sorry, bl uh, a greenish background. So it generates that. So we were quite excited about this. Um, and then uh, uh, when we published uh, this work, uh, Elman, who the student who was doing this work, uh, uh, he basically said, well, actually, if you ask Google, you can go on Google, and you can type in this query, a toilet seat sits open in the grass field. And if you just do image search, this is what comes up, uh, right? So this is, this is very hard to beat as a generative model, right? So uh, it says, this was pretty, um, uh, pretty upsetting for us. 
but then, uh, luckily for us, now, if you go to Google image search and type in this particular query, toilet seats, it's open in the grass field, this image, our image comes up as being higher ranked than this image, right, than the original image from Google. So we were very excited to convince Google that our representation of, of toilet seats, it's open in the grass field, is much better representation than, 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 than the original representation. And the reason why this is happening is that a lot of people would be clicking on that particular image, figuring out what, what the heck is this. And so Google now thinks that it's a much better representation of, of, uh, uh, of that particular query, which is great. Um, so uh, now let me, in the last 20 minutes, uh, let me show some of the open problems uh, that a lot of us in the community are working on. So one particular open problem is reasoning attention and memory. How do we get our algorithms to reason? How do we get our algorithms to incorporate memory? Uh, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. Natural language understanding is another very big area of research uh, right now, primarily because language is very difficult. Um, and we're beginning to see some, you know, some interesting results of using deep learning in that space. Deep reinforcement learning is another area that's picking up a lot of momentum, uh, and it's also a very exciting area. I'm going to show you some examples of, of that. It's kind of reviving of reinforcement learning, but combining it with the recent advances in function approximation um, uh, used by convolutional nets and, and deep nets. And of course, the areas of unsupervised learning, we've talked a lot about unsupervised learning. Transfer learning is another uh, important area, as well as areas of one-shot learning, where we, you know, trying to learn um, representations or trying to learn classes just looking at few examples, not necessarily a lot of labeled examples. So all of these areas, and I'm probably just, that's why I listed some, this is not all open research problems, but these are, in my view, are, are important ones to look at. So let me look at the first one. Let me show you one example uh, so that you can appreciate the complexities of, of, uh, of uh, these settings. Um, this is, let's say I give you the document. Right, and the document here uh, uh, says, arrested Illinois Governor Rob Blagojevich and his chief of staff John Harris on corruption charges, so forth. You know, remember this scandal about uh, uh, Rob Blagojevich taking on Obama's uh, Senate seat, uh, right? Let's say you have a document and I give you a query. President-elect Barack Obama on Tuesday said that uh, he was not aware um, uh, of alleged corruption by X, who was arrested on charges of trying and so forth. So the question is, who is X, right? Um, so your options are, it could be Barack Obama, it could be Rob Blagojevich, it could be John Harris, and such, right? And obviously the answer is Rob Blagojevich. And so you can see that for humans, this is a very simple um, task to solve. For machines, it turns out, is, is, is much more difficult, right? Because you have to understand something about the text, and you have to, some, you have to understand something about who is Rob Blagojevich, why is, and what's, what's happening, right? So that's, that's, a challenging, that's a challenging problem. One way of uh, uh, a, a lot of recent successes have been based on something that's called recurrent networks, right? And if we go back here, the reason why we want to be using recurrent networks is because we want to be able to take time into account, right? So if you look at the documents, there's a natural flow of time um, um, uh, or, or sort of se sequence. Um, and so recurrent neural networks, just to give you an idea, is that we're going to be encoding text uh, using recurrent networks. And the idea here is that you have a state at previous time step, you have an input at the current time step, and you have some nonlinearity in order to get the hidden state at the current time step, right? So it's sort of a nonlinear recurrent system uh, that, that, that operates through time. And typically that's the way, you know, if you think of x1 being word 1, x2 being word 2, x3 being word 3, then you're going to be encoding the representation by just looking at the hidden states and evolution of the hidden states over time. Okay? And so one of the ways of using these models is to use something that's called recurrent neural networks, again, to encode the document and the query. So in this case, you're running this, something that's called gated recurrent neural networks. It's a version of uh, an RNN. Uh, so you're encoding, you know, the entire text using RNN. So these are hidden states of a recurrent network. You're also encoding the query using recurrent network, right? So it's a query versus uh, uh, the entire text. And then you're using something that's called element-wise multiplication to model interactions between document and the query. So you're doing element-wise multiplication between each token from a query with each token from the text, uh, from the document. 
I'm not going to go into the details, but I'd like to point out this, this element-wise multiplication is the key for getting these models to work. And there's been a few papers trying to show that instead of addition, if you're actually doing multiplication, you can get much more powerful uh, representation, right? And so what happens in these kinds of models is you can think of them as, as multi-layer systems, multi-layer models, but where each layer is a recurrent network, right, that encodes representation of the document, and at the next step, again, it's a recurrent network and so forth, right? And you're combining it with the representation of the query. And at the end of the day, you do some form of softmax over the right answer. There's a little bit of an aggregation mechanism, but that's not very, very important. So what you see from our previous, uh, uh, what you've seen previously in your tutorial is that these are kind of very similar to what we've seen before, similar to convolutional networks or deep neural networks except for now every layer itself is a recurrent network, right? So you're kind of like seeing these recurrent networks as forming layers in this multi-layer network. And at the end of the day, you get a signal, which is a classification accuracy of how well, you know, you've done in terms of finding the right answer. So the, the, this particular problem is still a multi-way classification problem. It's just the architecture itself in each layer changes. All right. One interesting thing you can do is you can do attention. You can try to look at, you know, what, uh, because if you're doing this multiplicative interactions, you can actually look at layer one and layer two and try to figure out what's the correspondence between words in query and words in a document. And it turns out that if you look at the attention mechanism, the model is basically discovering that alleged corruption is highly associated with Rob Blagojevich and also Senate seat. Is, is firing a lot on Governor, on, on governor Rob Blagojevich. So the model is kind of figuring out that alleged corruption and Senate seat has something to do with finding the right answer, all right? And then it kind of finds the right answer as being Rob Blagojevich. So it's kind of implicit right now. Um, this is just by doing a little bit of analysis, but it does seem that these models do capture something interesting about the data. Uh, right, there's still a lot more work that needs to be done because it's not, this is just our speculation. We look at these attention mechanisms and we're trying to interpret what the model is doing. Uh, in many cases, it does something reasonable. In some cases, it does not. Uh, so this is still uh, a room for, for improvement. And if you're interested in playing with these models, there is a code, there is a data. For training the assistants, you can just go ahead and, 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 and get um, uh, uh, results. And these are sort of uh, state-of-the-art results uh, for this particular task. Obviously, we are very far away from human level performance because humans can solve this problem, I think, up to 99% accuracy. Uh, right now, our models are sitting within like 70% accuracy, which is still remarkable, uh, but still very far from reaching to 99% accuracy, uh, right? The other question that I think pops up a lot is how can we incorporate prime knowledge? So far, a lot of systems that we're using are just data driven. We're learning everything from the data. The question comes out is, can we actually incorporate some prior knowledge, some linguistic knowledge that we know about uh, the text? So here's one example, very simple example. Mary got the football, she went to the kitchen, she left the ball there, right? So the question might be, where is the football? Or where is the ball? And obviously the right answer would be kitchen, uh, right? But we also know something about co-reference. We know that Mary, she, and she refers to the same thing, right? We also know that football and ball mean the same thing, right? So what we can do is if we know some prior knowledge about linguistic knowledge, can we incorporate that into the structure? And, and it, in fact, we can. We can construct something that's uh, something that we call memory as a cyclic graph encoding. So this is an RNN with a memory block in it that kind of encodes what's connected to what. And you can use different kind of um, prime knowledge. You can use parse trees, you can use co-references and, and, and a lot of other linguistic uh, 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 knowledge in order to basically augment your RNN with these additional uh, representations. And in many cases, it gives us substantial improvement in, in, in model performance. And in general, this is an open question of how can we take, you know, a text? How can we use co-reference dependency parses, because they work fairly well. How can we use Freebase, which tells us something about entity relations? Can we take in, into account WordNet, which tells us something about word relations, and really build or incorporate this into the recurrent network, and also incorporate it in such a way that if that information, this extra information is useful, 
we want them all to use it. If it's useless and we can actually figure out from the data that we don't need that representation, then obviously the model can just learn to use the raw text or the raw representation, right? And to get the right text representation. So that's one of the big open areas. How can we combine deep learning data-driven approaches with some prior information about, uh, uh, about the world that, 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 uh, uh, that we have? Here's an example of, of showing you, I wanted to show you the need for having um, that representation. Because this is um, a model that was trained on 7,000 romantic novels, but it didn't use any linguistic knowledge. It didn't use any, any sort of any prime knowledge. It's just raw recurrent networks learning on lots and lots of uh, uh, um, data. So this was done on romantic novels, and then we basically, uh, Jamie Kiris, uh, uh, who did this work, she basically said, well, given an image, can I generate um, a short description of that image, right? And it kind of generates interesting things. If you look at what it generates, it, she, you know, it says she was in love with, uh, uh, with him for the first time in months, so, so she had no intentions of escaping. I don't really know what that means. Uh, the sun had risen from the ocean, making her feel more alive than normal. She's beautiful, but the truth is I don't know what to do. The sun was just starting to fade away, leaving people scattered around the Atlantic Ocean, right? So if you look at this, it kind of looks funny because semantically it doesn't make sense because, you know, the model talks about the sun had risen from the ocean and then it says the sun was just starting to fade away. But at the same time, it tries to describe what's going on in the image. And if you see syntactically, it actually does very well, right? As a language model, it doesn't make a lot of mistakes. Semantically, we still need a lot of work to do, right? And this is where this notion of, of, of trying to incorporate some prior knowledge might be uh, very beneficial to us. Um, um, the last part uh, I want to show you is I want to show you uh, uh, examples of uh, reinforcement learning and memory. Um, so what is, uh, what is reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning is this beautiful area that I encourage many of you to, to look at. Is this, this notion of learning behaviors. It's this notion of having observations and mapping them into actions, right? So trying to learn in sequence of observations. And if you think about what the reinforcement learning does is you have an agent, which could be a deep neural network, which, is, which it is uh, in one of these applications. You have an action. The action affects the world. The world spits back out the next observation, and it also sometimes gives you the reward. It tells you how well you're doing, right? So this is a standard setup for reinforcement learning, and in the last couple of years, there's, born, there's been a lot of uh, work on trying to uh, learn external memory, trying to define uh, algorithms so that you can store important information about the world in such a way that it can help you solve um, uh, particular tasks in the future. Just, or, 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 or figure out what the right actions would be in the future. And uh, there's been some uh, nice work coming out of DeepMind by Alex Grace on differentiable neural computers as well as neural Turing machines that effectively defining these read and write operations. All right. But before I get there, let me show you an example um, of, uh, of reinforcement learning. I don't know how it's going to be over, uh, over the web, so it's probably going to be a little bit jittery, but still, uh, let me see if I can, uh, if I can play, play it. This is deep reinforcement learning. Uh, the input to the model is just um, uh, a sequence of frames, so for every single frame, and the output is just the action. Move left, move right, so now it's being stuck at the corner, uh, right? After a little bit of training, and, and your reward is collecting objects. So every time you collect an object, you get a reward, right? Every time you hit the lava, you get negative reward. So you're just providing uh, a very simple feedback to the model, just collect as many rewards. And the interesting thing is model is just learning to navigate by itself in this environment and avoid, you know, falling into lava, uh, right? So it's, it's, it's interesting, it's remarkable that, that the model can do it. And the input is just the observation itself, right? What you see on the screen. And if you, you can train the model using different textures, so the model can adapt to basically figuring out, uh, you know, how to navigate around, even in the presence of very different textures. And then what you can do is you can navigate around in a completely um, unknown map, right? So this is an environment that the model has never seen before, and you're just navigating in this environment, right? You basically... Um, uh, in a known map, you can just figure out where you should be going to collect the objects. 
And the other interesting thing is that you can um, uh, learn to play um, uh, uh, the deathmatch, uh, right? So this is an example of, of uh, the model is basically learning to play deathmatch. And the interesting thing is that it can be very precise in terms of aiming, much better than humans. And so you can do way better than, than, than the human players, uh, right? So you can move around and can be, you know, uh, uh, and so it can, it can basically outplay an average human, right? So you can see that. Uh, but the problem with this model is that it's, it's very reactive, right? It's very reactive because yeah, it, it basically just doesn't have any memory. So it doesn't understand that if you pass in a particular room and there are some edges in the room, and then when you don't see the edges, you basically forget about them, right? So it's very reactive. What I see, I execute now. So it cannot plan, it cannot remember what happened in the past, and, and this is where the memory comes in, which I think is a very important uh, uh, topic for us, for us to study. Let me show you just uh, an intuition. Let me just a little bit of um, uh, motivation, what we try to do here. Suppose I'm in the environment, let's say Doom-like environment, 3D-like environment. There is something that's called an indicator. And if this indicator is blue, much like you're seeing here, then I need to find the green block. If the indicator is pink, I have to find the red block, right? And if I tell you these rules a priori, if I hand wire those rules into the system, then I can solve the problem easily, right? But let's say that I don't tell the system there is something that's called indicator, there is something that's called, you know, these target states that you need to go to. You have to discover it on your own, right? You have to discover that there is something that's called an indicator. And I have to remember the state of the indicator because it tells me what my future action should be, um, right? And so you have negative reward if the uh, agent doesn't find the correct block after n steps. So you have to like, execute it in, uh, in n steps or you go to the wrong block, right? Now, notice that I need some form of a memory because I need to remember the state of the indicator because the distance between the indicator and the time that I need to go to a particular state can be very large. So I have to remember what happened uh, in the past. And this is the idea that, you know, the way to think about this is the way that we're doing this is you have an observation, you have some representation of the observation, uh, which we call the right vector, and then you write it into the memory. Um, there's a specific uh, mechanism for writing it. And then you take an action, right? And the action itself uh, is exactly what, uh, you know, uh, a move left, move right, and such. At the next time step, I'm going to be reading from my memory using attention mechanism to read from the right part of the memory. Then I'm going to write back into the memory my observations and then execute the action. So what I've, seen, what I've shown you with the Doom is just the case where you remove this memory block uh, uh, completely from the model, right? Uh, and this is kind of the evolution that takes over time. You have this operation which you find the right vector, you write into the memory and so forth. I'm not giving you the details exactly what these operations are. You can look at the paper, but it kind of looks a lot like a recurrent neural network with a very specific uh, memory mechanism attached to it. So let me show you an example of, um, of navigating in a random maze. So this is a setting where, you know, the model sees there is a blue indicator, it goes to the wrong target, it figures out that this is the wrong target, so I have to retract. So it goes back, and it goes back until it finds the right target. So this is an example of where the memory is actually, uh, was very useful because it stores, it learned to store the right information about the target. And so it can use this memory in order to figure out where to go to the next target. So in some sense, it's actually learning what these rules are, uh, you know, what the rules in the environment are so that, so that I can find I can find the right target. And this is the case of trying to build these intelligent agents, uh, right? I really believe that this notion of trying to have this external memory so that we can remember things, important information in the past so that we can take the right, the right actions in the future. And also, can we reason and communicate? Can we build these knowledge bases? Can we get these systems to understand natural language so that we can kind of execute both of them uh, um, at the same time. I think this is one of, one of the big, big challenges in, in, in the machine learning community uh, uh, right now. And the other big challenge that I haven't really uh, spent time looking at is, is trying to learn from few examples. So when I showed you this example of memory, it required us lots and lots of simulations, which would be prohibitive if, if we were trying to do it in the real world. 
So trying to learn from few examples, from few experiences, uh, and trying to learn the right behavior from few examples, I think one of the biggest challenges uh, of, uh, of, uh, of machine learning and how we can do it, it's still a very much open uh, research problem. So in summary, let me just say that I've looked at a lot of uh, different algorithms on supervised uh, learning, but as well as in supervised learning. And the remarkable thing about these models is that, you know, they improve upon the current state of the art in a lot of different application domains, right? In object recognition, detection, text retrieval, speech recognition, and more recently in the space of um, reinforcement learning and natural language understanding. So there's a lot of uh, exciting progress happening in that space. So it's, it's, a, it's a very exciting time, and I don't think it's going to go away uh, very soon. So let me stop here. Uh, thank you very much, and, and, and we have some time for, uh, for questions. So thank you. Uh, so I'm actually working on this uh, reinforcement learning and I was wondering if there are already techniques to infer after learning what was the important part about the task, so to really understand the task afterward. Yeah, it's a good question. I, um, um, I, I think there is some, you're basically saying, okay, you get your URL, your reinforcement learning does, does accomplish the task, whatever that task is, and then you're trying to figure out what are the important subtasks or what are the important sort of sub-features that the model uh, has discovered, right? Um, I don't know if there's been any work or that kind of tries to do that. There's been some work of building hierarchical uh, RL models where you define something that's called options or subtasks. Right? And you're defining them explicitly to say, this is my subtask, and this is my subtask. And you have a meta uh, mechanism that tries to figure out which subtask you need to execute. I believe there's been some work into trying to figure out other specific subtasks that the model is discovering on its own. But it's a very difficult uh, uh, problem in general. And I think it's a very good problem, right? Because you're trying to solve some meta task. And then you're trying to figure out, has the model learned to, 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 like if I'm trying to go to a particular part, has the model learned to, to walk through the door is a very important subtask in order to achieve my goal, uh, right? So you should look at the literature on hierarchical RL. Uh, that's one area where a lot of us are looking at, uh, at right now as well, sort of like looking at sub-discovery of subtasks. So you have to solve simple, simple tasks before you can solve more complex tasks. Um, Hi, um, I was wondering um, what future directions you see in dialogue generation with these models, particularly with your comment about simpler tasks, it seems like um, learning simpler structures particularly might be a very useful direction to go in generating dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, uh, I should actually, I should have added the dialogue systems um, is it's going to be, I think it's going to be the next big area of research, right? A lot of, um, and also using perhaps simpler models, so incorporating some lingu linguistic structure is, is probably going to be important. Um, we're actually at CMU, there's a lot of work happening on building dialogue-based systems and trying to use uh, neural networks and deep learning for dialogue-based systems, but it turns out to be extremely, extremely hard. Um, one of the problems right now in dialogue-based systems is evaluation. How do you evaluate a dialogue-based system? Uh, that's, that's, that's one general uh, problem. It's also, there's also some attempts of using reinforcement learning for dialogue-based systems. Um, the challenge really is in dialogue-based system, in my view, is uh, right now, a lot of work right now in NLP and the work that we're doing is more like, here's the text, here's the query, answer the query, right? And it's a classification problem. You can, you can evaluate it very precisely, how many answers you got correctly. In dialogue-based systems, it becomes hard because if, if I ask something and my bot asks something back or says something bad, and as a human I ask something else and my bot asks something else and so forth, so it goes through multiple turns and after multiple turns there has to be some evaluation, uh, right? So, and that's, that's very challenging. 
um, right? It's very challenging also to simulate this environment because if I want to build a really sophisticated dialogue-based systems, uh, I really need to explore a lot of things. I really need to say, well, if I answered, if I ask you this question versus this question, how would the overall dialogue proceed? Um, right, so it's, it's, it's a challenging problem, but this is something that we're going to be working on uh, uh, in the future. I know that there is a, a whole dialogue community in, uh, in NLP that sort of looks at template-based uh, type of systems as well as matching-based types of systems and such. So the question is, can you make your dialogue be more like uh, actually looking at the raw language? Uh, and trying to come up with uh, these recurrent networks actually giving you realistic looking sentences and questions is, is I think is going to be challenging. Um, but, but I can't say much about, you know, uh, ha have there been any progress? I think there's been a little bit progress in the deep learning community, but not as much as it should be. So there, I, I assume uh, it's just in the next two to three years, this is going to be a, one of the biggest uh, research areas for sure. It's just very hard to evaluate, and there aren't a lot of good data sets, large-scale data sets right now. So that's, um, that's sort of holding, uh, holding us back in, in, that, in that area. Hey, so I'm working in the robotics domain where it's actually seems in some tasks that the data is quite sparse and expensive to collect if you want to work on a real system and potentially inaccurate if you work in simulations. I wonder what, what are your ideas on trading off that inaccurate simulations versus highly expensive data from the real system? And then also how do we tune or generalize models if you say our robot changes frequently, but we don't want to retrain everything and we just maybe added one component or so. How would we adapt it if we represent right. stuff of a deep network? Right, that's a very good question and I don't think I have a very good answer because that's a problem that, uh, um, it's, a, it's a very hard problem and I think that's the problem that eventually machine learning folks and deep learning hubs folks and robotics community will have to come together. Um, and the reason why is because in deep learning right now, we just work with simulators, right? We kind of like leave the actual real world uh, kind of uh, away from us, uh, right? And the machine learning. So if you look at a lot of papers, a lot of papers are just basically based on simulators. Um, and this is bad because I agree with you, the real data and collecting the real data and even just running um, uh, running the, uh, uh, the robotics platform in the real world is very expensive and simulators are very inaccurate. So how can you bridge the gap between the two? It's a very difficult question. The, the, the true answer is I don't know. I think that ultimately what will happen is that um, uh, we're going to be training our models in the simulator because sometimes it's very hard to, um, to, 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 to even in the real world have uh, a setting, uh, so for example, you have a drone, right? And you want to put the drone into some situation that it's close to crashing, right? So that the algorithm can learn and avoid these situations. You can't really just crush your drones thousand times in real life, uh, right, to, to, to test. So that has to be done in a simulation only. Um, and uh, ultimately, I think that a lot of algorithms will probably be built and tested in a simulator because if, if, if the algorithm fails in a simulator, it will probably fail in the real world anyways. Uh, so we have to be training our systems in a simulator, but then the question is how do we take that system and adapt it to the real world? That's going to be a big challenge. And there is a little bit of, in my view, um, there is different opinions. People who work in robotic space basically do say that uh, simulators, going from simulators to the real uh, uh, is going to be very difficult. It's going to be a very interesting domain adaptation problem, right? Because you work in one domain and now you effectively work in a different domain. Um, the other question is, um, will, it, will it work? Uh, but, but it has to, because again, as I mentioned before, there are core cases that you will be simulating in the simulator that you cannot really simulate in the real life. Like you can't simulate your drone crashing too many times, uh, right? Um, uh, same thing happens in you know, self-driving cars uh, or, or in uh, any, any other robotics uh, application, right? Um, that's, that's an open area of research. I don't really have good, good intuition as to, as to how it will work. And, and so it really is gonna be, I think that this, these problems are gonna be solved by people working 
on both areas in deep learning as well as robotics, uh, uh, right? And both communities have been sort of separate so far. Like, you know, machine learning community, we go to NIPS and ICML. Robotics communities, they go to ICRA and IRS, and then it's just, there's a little bit of disconnect. But, but that will have to happen. The connection will have to happen for us to really solve that. Um, you know, but, but I don't really have, I think that's going to be a problem of really domain adaptation. And depending on different problems, it either will, simulators will have to be improved. There's also some work on using generative adversarial networks to take the output of the simulator and make it look more realistic, more like what you see on real data. So trying to bridge the gap between the simulated data and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the data in the realistic data that you actually observe in, on your robot. Uh, so there's been some work on that, but, but very little. We have one question from the other room, so um, let's take this one. You have to switch on the mic on the other side, guys. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, no, it's yes. You can hear me. Great. Yeah, so uh, I have a question about importance weighted autoencoders. Okay. Um, so to the extent that uh, that maps on to traditional variational inference with uh, like variational autoencoders, um, like, is there a mapping between the, the distributions that you get out of that, which I guess can be complex or multimodal, to, I guess, traditional variational family? I, what is the, the variational family that you uh, are working with with the IWE? Yep. Let me just get back to this question. Very good question. Let me just, uh, ah, here it is. Oh, no. Here it is. Uh, no, this is variational. Let me just get back to this. OK. So, so the Q distribution itself is exactly the same distribution uh, as what Uh, what it is, is it's just a simple um, uh, a, a deterministic feedforward pass. And the distribution over the hidden states, let me just try to get there as well. And the distribution of the hidden states uh, is just a Gaussian distribution, right? So in this particular setting, your Q distribution is just, uh, um, um, uh, in, in this case, just a Gaussian distribution, right? We don't um, see any slides yet. So I, looks like it takes some time to let slides come up. Oh, OK, OK. Uh, but in terms of the relationship to the family, so the relationship is really the case that if k, the number of samples, is 1, you recover back the original variation autoencoder, right? Um, but if you draw multiple samples, then your posterior, your approximate posterior, could be multimodal. And the reason you can think of it is the following. Let's say my q is Gaussian, right? Uh, but let's say my true posterior has two modes, right? Then what this important sampling does, what it does is it basically says, draw me, let's say, 100 samples, right, from the Gaussian. And because we're using importance weighted, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be weighting each importance of each sample by the likelihood. And what it does is it basically says, ah, but in the true posterior, certain areas are unlikely, certain other areas are more likely. So even if your proposal is Gaussian, by basically assigning different weights to different uh, samples, you can reshape your posterior to be multimodal, right? Um, does that make sense? Uh, yes, so that, that it does. So, so then you, you don't, I guess, have a, an analytic density. You, you have to, yeah, I mean, take this, this Monte Carlo approximation that's by sampling. Right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. There's been some work okay. of basically saying, look, you can, you can make your Q distribution be a mixture model, for example. You can backdrop through the mixture as well. In this particular setting, a mixture of Gaussians. In this particular setting, all we're doing is we're basically saying we're drawing Monte Carlo samples. Let's say you draw 1,000 samples or 100 samples. And then you reweight each one of them. So in principle, your posterior, you can reshape your posterior to be whatever shape it needs to be or whatever shapes the model decides it to be. Um, and we do find that these kinds of samples give us substantial improvements on, you know, toyish examples like MNIST data set uh, compared to, you know, simply drawing one sample. So drawing multiple samples, 100 samples, can reshape the posterior and then leads to better likelihood. The problem with importance-weighted autoencoders so far have been that it's expensive, right? Uh, 
So drawing multiple samples because you need to evaluate each sample and say how good the sample is according to your model. Uh, so there's a likelihood term and that's, you know, it could be expensive to compute. So in practice, unfortunately, people basically say one sample is enough just for practical purposes, right? Because if I work with very large scale data sets, million examples, it's much better to just draw one sample and go through a lot of examples instead of drawing multiple samples per example. But in the settings where you don't have a lot of data and, and you have sufficient compute, or you can parallelize across multiple machines, these samples can give you much, much better estimate to the posterior um, and, and do give you gains in the likelihood, uh, in overall performance of the model as measured according to log probabilities. Great, thank you. So we have another question in the other room, right? Yes, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes. Great. Hi. Um, I wondered um, how many, uh, you said you have to, uh, to train super long your um, algorithm, for example, on uh, this uh, Quake or whatever game it was, shooting game. Mm -hmm. um, how, I mean, how, to how many minutes of games does it, uh, does it compare, or hours of game does it, uh, yeah, does it correspond? And how is this compared, for example, with uh, human life? I mean, for example, I think we, we would need a few years maybe, two, well, well let's le at least one year to be able to walk around in our, in, a, in our environment. So it's not exactly the same kind of task, but I think there's the right. pre-processing of the images first, uh, a step uh, which will take an amount of time. And is it comparable with uh, the time that you would need to play uh, Quake? Okay, so, so let, me, let, let me make a uh, uh, connection. So, so for the Doom game, uh, learning to play Doom and sort of learning to play a uh, shooting game, um, it took, uh, you know, uh, maybe a couple of days for training this model, like a shooting model, uh, right? So it's not that bad uh, just because we use convolutional uh, models and because the environment itself is not that complicated, it's just a bunch of textures. Uh, you basically, after training for two to five hours on a GPU, the model learns to navigate around. So it's, you know, it's not that bad. The model can move around, yeah. right? They execute actions. And but this, it's not this, like you're learning five hours of uh, playing game, I mean, of images. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But it's very different. It's not like the agent is actually learning to walk. The agent already can walk. We're just kind of learning to just navigate, um, you know, execute action so you don't get stuck in the corners, you don't go into lava, you don't, like, you don't die by stepping on certain things. So it takes about two to five hours to do that, and then actually learning to uh, efficiently to play the Doom game takes about a uh, couple of days of training, right? So it's still very long. Um, but at the same time, humans are, you know, uh, it's one of those things that maybe playing Doom might take human the same time, but then humans can are very good at generalizing to new tasks. Like if I ask a human, don't play uh, Quake, uh, don't, don't, don't shoot other bots, but like, you know, try to find me these objects or try to execute these plans. And humans are very good at doing it. So humans are very good at transfer learning. These algorithms are not very good at transfer learning because if I basically say, well, now let's play a different game and the rules of the game are these, then you would have to spend another day or two to retrain the model, uh, right? So compared to humans, we are very, very far away. Uh, for the case of memory and trying to learn behaviors by basically saying, oh, there's an indicator and I need to go to these states, uh, it takes, you know, it also takes about a couple of days on GPUs, so running through millions of episodes before the model can learn that. Humans could solve this task much faster, right? Because the way you can think about solving the task, the maze task, is really the following. I put you in a maze, random maze. You don't know what the maze is. You move around, you stumble upon green target. You get the reward. Right, you get positive reward. So you say, ah, good, so next time I'm gonna go to this target, okay? Next time in the environment you go to the same target and you get negative reward. And then you're saying, what's going on? One I get, once I get positive reward, the other time I get negative reward. So what causes this? And then after maybe a few episodes, a human would say, ah, I keep seeing this blue indicator. And it seems like if it's a blue indicator, then I can discover these rules to go to the green blocks. But if I see this pink indicator, it seems like I need to go to the red block. I think people can discover these rules way faster than machines, uh, right? And we have the memory, so we can quickly learn, ah, there's this indicator, so I can associate it with this target. Kind of like finding these causal relationships. 
And machines are not very good at that right now. So it, it kind of, you have to learn the representations, you have to, and then always, you know, over longer periods of time, you're basically figuring out there is this causal relationship in the environment. And it takes a very long time for machine, or for at least for this algorithm to learn that. Um, so again, we are very far from uh, uh, trying to find these causal relationships compared to these algorithms, and maybe we need to put a little bit more prior bias or inductive bias that there are these relationships, so look for them, um, because we haven't really done that. Um, and also in the case of transfer learning, people are very good at learning to play one game, a few games, and then just you go to a different game, you go to a different environment, you can just play, uh, right? Uh, these algorithms are not very good at doing that. So this, this comes to the notion of one-shot learning, or learning from very few behaviors. I can just show a human a few times, and that's it. Uh, machines don't, don't do that right now. At least our algorithms don't do that. So it's a very important area of research. OK, thanks. Well, thank you, Ross, for your availability. Um, I think what you presented last, especially memory and subtask challenges, is really promising and interesting. And I will want to ask you, based on your experience, do you think the next change, the next improvement, will come from a top-down theoretical approach or from a bottom-up uh, based experience, as in maybe combining the tools we already have? So the question is, do you, think, do you think we have the right tool set to tackle it and it's just about thinking or do we need more theoretical framework to define stuff well and get it right? Cheers. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's probably going to be a combination of both, uh, speaking like a Bayesian, I guess. Um, uh, ultimately, I think that it's going to be a combination of both, right? Because I think that notion like memory, attention mechanisms, uh, uh, reasoning, is something that... Um, you know, these are kind of, you know, to some extent, they're a little bit vague uh, uh, words, but at the same time, we will need a little bit more theoretical justification, right? And I know that in the field of psychology and cognitive sciences, um, uh, neuroscience, these concepts are being studied a lot, uh, right? Uh, but a lot of it has also been just a theoretical, on um, the theoretical setting. Now we actually, you know, starting to get the tools of using attention, and we actually see huge uh, successes of using attention mechanisms for machine translation systems, that's in particular, for caption generation systems, and it seems like just even getting state-of-the-art results. Um, in the space of memory, I, I do think it's going to be a combination of developing new tools uh, as well as, you know, understanding a little bit better the theoretical properties. Like One of the big problems right now with memory um, is that in order to make the systems differentiable, what that basically means is that when I read from the memory, when I try to retrieve something from the memory, I effectively, you know, looking at every single cell in my memory, right? So if my memory is large, contains billions of elements, in order to define differentiable operation, I have to touch every single element, which computation is going to be expensive, and it's not going to get, get us uh, uh, very far. And then, you know, people are trying to define uh, uh, memory mechanisms based on discrete choices, like, you know, I choose a specific location to look in the memory. Once you start dealing with discrete choices, then how do you train these systems? How do you learn what part of memory to access? Um, that's where, you know, algorithms like reinforce, uh, reinforcement learning comes into play, because you're making these discrete choices, these discrete actions. Um, uh, and so this is, this is challenging because it, you know, increases the variance of the estimator in the gradients and such. So it basically means that we don't really have uh, a good learning algorithms right now for reinforcement learning, or good optimization algorithms for reinforcement learning, right? Um, and that's something that needs to be developed uh, moving forward. And these notion of memory, attention, I think are very important. And we need to understand a little bit better how it happens, how humans are doing that and how we can design better algorithms for doing it, right? Because I think that memory is going to be very important for us. And, and this is one of the long-standing problems in machine learning is how do you remember over long periods of time what's important, uh, right? It's, a, it's kind of like this long-term dependency task. It's a very difficult task. 
in traditional models like recurrent networks, even LSTMs or all of these uh, uh, long-term, short-term memory networks, they cannot remember things that are very far away from each other, right? So they can remember things that happened, you know, a few times steps ago, maybe 10 or 20 times steps ago, but something remembering on a longer scale is very difficult. So that's why I believe these external memory mechanisms where you actually kind of writing down what's important. And then the question is, how do you decide what's important? How do you decide what to retrieve from the memory? Perhaps they could be hierarchical representation of the memory, so these, these hierarchical softmax models. So these are all interesting tasks. All I can say right now is that these systems that I've shown you are very brittle. Uh, they're very unstable, they're very difficult to train, um, and it just has to do with optimization. So we don't really have a good handle of that right now. We don't have the right tools. So I think it's going to be a combination of both, both uh, top-down, trying to understand, you know, uh, developing theoretical tools, but also looking at bottom-up and trying to just come up with, uh, you know, new techniques, new optimization algorithms so that we can train these models more efficiently. Right, right now it's almost like a random search. Hello? Okay, yep. thank you. Um, I don't know if there's one very last question from the audience. I don't know, is there any? Um, very, very last. If not, then yeah, let's just thank Russell again. Very much appreciated. Well, thank you. Yes, and I'll try to, uh, and I apologize. Again, I apologize for not making it. I booked the flights and everything. I was very excited to be, uh, to be there, but just because of the family-related uh, uh, issues, I couldn't, I couldn't be there. But I'll definitely make it, uh, make it there at, at sometimes in the future. We look um, forward to that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, very much appreciated that you made and I also, it. I also make my slides available online for those of you who would be interested in just looking through the slides as well. Great, great. great. Thank, thanks thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.